Are we good? I don't know. Uh, good we're go. good. All right, let's do this. Let's right. do this. Okay. Wow. I, this is the problem. We don't have a script. So, um, yeah. Oh, this is deja vu all over again. I know. I know. Technology will always let you down, won't it? Um, okay. Well, all right. <sighs> this presentation is AI powered mock up magic. Prototype it absolutely is. For ChatGPT and Midjourney. That's right. I'm Andrew Miller. I'm the program director for the gymnasium, and I'm joined with my esteemed colleague, Jeremy Osborne, who's the director of learning. And we're going to take you on a bit of a journey. I won't say it. A journey uh, to show you how we use AI tools, how we can use AI tools uh, in a common scenario, designing mock-ups. Uh, um, so we're going to aim to do this demo in slightly less than 45 minutes since we had to restart and we'll get to questions and answers at the end, hopefully, and um, let's jump ahead. So what we're going to cover today is a brief overview of large language models, which surely you've heard of, um, LLMs. If you haven't, you'll know about them next. Um, we're going to share with you an approach to including AI in your workflow. Uh, we're going to specifically by showing you chat GPT and Midjourney and how we might use them to create some mockups and uh, share with you some strategies for improving the results that you can get from some of these generative tools. Uh, we did a deep dive into chat GPT 3.5, uh, which is the one that's available to you for free at this point and a bunch of other AI related tools. So you don't have to. Um, we've learned a lot about their strengths and their weaknesses, and um, we'll we'll cover the weaknesses in the subsequent session because um, they are kind of fascinating. Um, but uh, first, uh, let's talk a little bit about the basics of LLMs, or large language models. Uh, and Jeremy, I'm going to hand it over to you. Do you want to drive the slides for this section, or do uh, you... no? I think we can. Okay, that's fine. Um, all right. So yeah, LLMs, um, if you're not familiar with them, this is the highest of high level overviews. We're gonna keep it simple. Having said that, we do think, even though this might feel like school for five minutes, that uh, knowing a little bit about how these things work behind the scenes is, is going to be very helpful. So the simplest way to explain it is autocomplete, right? LLMs are really good at predicting the most likely way to complete a string of text very similar to what happens on your phone when you start typing a text message and it begins to suggest options. In this case, the next word being messages. Now again, super, super simplified way of looking at it, but just to explain a little bit more, putting yourself in the shoes of one of these LLMs, they kind of think like this. You give it a partial sentence. I really like French something. Fries is the next word or possible next word, and the likelihood that it, you meant fries is very high. And then I really like French movies. The likelihood that's your uh, choice or preference would be high. Again, I really like French movie, singular, not plural, likelihood that that is accurate is going to be low. I really like French, the, very low. Although if that said, I really like Andre, the, that, anyway, <laughs> I really like French R um, is almost impossible that that would be the correct possible next word. So we're just doing the simplified version of this Chat GPT and these other systems, they do this on a much, much larger level using a level of complexity that, um, quite frankly, no one quite understands, even the folks who programmed or made this. But what is unique about this? Why is everyone so excited about Chat GPT? Where are these results um, coming from? Well, again, if you compare it to the software that we've been used to over the last 40, 50 years, all of that was written by people who wrote explicit step-by-step -step instructions for the computer to run. These new systems do not work that way. They use something called a neural network and training or trained 
bolded here is the important part. So again, it was trained on all sorts of data and that data is something that is kind of important. Um, where does it come from? What are the ramifications of that? But in the end, these computer programs uh, use this form of artificial intelligence to generate human-like language. And again, garbage in, garbage out. So the amount of copy that one of these models um, ingests is really important, as well as the quality. So the example that you're going to be seeing later, we're generating web copy. And the truth is, these systems were trained on billions, perhaps, of web pages, or at least millions. Uh, and so in a way, it's gotten very good at understanding what people like to see for web copy. And then they predict and generate text based on the input they receive, otherwise known as prompts. And those are things that we're going to be looking at. I'll hand it back over to Andrew to talk about GPT. What does it mean? Yeah, so we, we see chat GPT and uh, we and everybody says chat GTP instead. Um, it stands for a generative pre-trained transformer. Um, it's generative in the sense that it creates new content uh, as opposed to a search engine that is returning results that of existing pages, for example, a GPT model will generate completely new content. They're pre-trained in the sense that the models have been trained um, are for specific applications, whether it's interpreting code that you're writing or generating code for you to write, um, whether it's uh, creating artwork, um, those models have been trained specifically for that purpose. And they're transformers in the sense that they can understand the context and relationships in the language, in the large language models, and in addition to the pre-trained models specific for the application. They're transformers. There's more than meets the eye. Much more. Uh -huh. All right. Yeah. Our scenario for today. Our scenario for today is somewhat typical and will be um, increasingly more typical for um, uh, designers in the future, um, we, we predict. Um, and so our scenario for today is that you are a fresh-faced designer. First day on the job, you're going to be working for this company, Priority Bicycles. And they make a bunch of different interesting bikes. And um, one of them is this e-bike. And um, what we're going to, what, uh, what the, your first day on the job, of course, like most first days on the job, you arrive, the content strategist is leaving on vacation, the art director is leaving on vacation. There's a post-it note on your desk, welcome to your new job, we want you to tackle this project for us. We want some mock-ups for um, this bike. And um, so what you'll see is, it, traditionally, um, the uh, their products, their, their um, websites, their marketing has been very product centric. And we'll give you a little glimpse of what that looks like. Um, this is what the, uh, you should be able to see now. Okay, so this doesn't seem to work the way that we sort of hoped, yeah. but well, it's we a. Can just, we can move to the next slide instead. Of yeah, it's a typically slide. it's a it's a typical pay, a typical product page. But the point is, and sorry, I'll just jump in. So the point is, is that again, as this new designer, um, you're given this product page with lots of specifications. It's talking about the gear shifts. It's talking about the battery power and. What all you know as this designer is, is that uh, they're trying to create a different type of marketing page, or at least two different types. And we'll talk about the details. But here is the, the, the mock-up that probably you would start with. And if you don't know a whole lot about e-bikes, if you don't know a whole lot about this company, because you just started today, but you want to make a good impression, this is very daunting and any designer who is faced with, and this is not, not even a blank screen, right? This is just kind of like the generic lorem ipsum mock-up and you wanna make a good impression. You wanna take this 
a lot further than this um, so that when that creative director and content strategist come back, you can hopefully make a good impression and maybe they'll, maybe they'll promote you. Yeah, so we just want to remind you that what we're making is a mock-up. It's disposable. It's a prototype. The, I, this part of the process should be the, the quickest part. The, this is the ideation, the sketching. Um, but we also know that there are some real problems when you try to use lorem ipsum, uh, not only for communicating your design ideas, but also as an actual design tool, it becomes problematic for getting your, your text to work um, in your design. So uh, here is a um, so again, the, 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 the task at hand is to um, create marketing landing pages that are lifestyle marketing focused. And there are two categories of audience that you've been asked to explore in your, land, in your uh, landing page mockups. The first one is uh, college students. And um, I'm going to assume that this video won't play um, the way that we had intended either. But um, suffice to say, I'm sure that this is a typical thing that you've done. You've typed a, a question into Google, and what you've what you've gotten is a slew of results uh, that um, require you to then go to subsequent pages, which may very well have the information that you need, but you're going to have to navigate through a lot of information. And really, what you're looking for is just a handful of pointers, because this is the first time that you're putting together marketing content for this particular audience. Yeah. And I want to point out before we jump into this, we're going to start showing you some of the action here. But just to follow up on that, this is something that designers do and have to do a lot. <laughs> in fact, I would even say when I was teaching um, classes to, to aspiring design students, that this is one of the main attractions of being a designer, is that you have this ability to kind of learn about new stuff. You're naturally curious. Um, you're put in these scenarios where you quickly have to um, be the expert or at least present material in a clear and concise way, whether it's visually or through text. And the truth is, like, it's hard to learn, especially complicated stuff, but anything really quickly. And one of our um, one of, one of the, the precepts that we're proposing here is that, that LLMs and chat GPT are actually really good ways to learn something quickly. They so can be. They can be. And there are some real caveats with that. And those are things we're going to talk about later, but uh, not in this presentation. But we're going to talk about the dangers of this. But we're presenting a nice rosy glow here. We're presenting the ideal workflow. And so to begin with, we're going to start with this task, which is really, what are the three most important considerations when marketing products to college students? So at this point, we're going to start playing a little tango, and hopefully um, the stream will continue. So everything good, hopefully. So, I believe uh, so. Here I'm in chat GPT 3.5, um, and this is the free version. This is the version that everyone can have access to without upgrading. And at the very bottom here, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to put in that prompt. So down here at the bottom of the screen, what are the three most important considerations in marketing products to college students? And we're going to let it run. Could you imagine if computers actually made that sound when you did things with them? They should. I don't know why they I know. Started. So uh, we get some nicely formatted uh, results here. So number one, relevance and value. I'm not going to read all of this, but college students are often on tight budgets and have specific needs and interests. OK, sounds legit. Number two, digital presence and social media. College students are highly connected and spend a significant amount of time online. OK, that reads. And authenticity and transparency. College students tend to be skeptical of traditional advertising and are more receptive to authentic and transparent communication. OK, again. Uh, all three of these things kind of feel on a gut level like that that matches my expectation. And there's more in here, um, but again, we're starting from the highest level here and we're um, 
simply trying to make sure that we're, as a designer, we're getting, we're, we're entering at a good access point. Yeah, nope. so Jeremy, I think the, the the next step would just be to, let's refine it, right? What are the three most important considerations when marketing e-bikes to college students? Yep. So now we're diving in a little bit. We will really want to understand because again, e-bikes are not really a thing that this designer knows much about. So we're going to plug that in. And it's going to give us a similar format three important considerations. And again, a lot of material here, but again, this is kind of the point. We're learning quickly. So affordability and cost effectiveness, convenience and sustainability, versatility, versatility and style. So again, uh, this sounds pretty good. We can look at some of the details here. We can see that highlighting the eco-friendly aspects of e-bikes. Yeah, that makes sense. Contributing to a healthy environment. Many college students are concerned about climate change and want to make responsible choices. And they even kind of give us like a little bit of extra uh, details at the bottom here, and this is always an interesting part of, of these models is that Andrew and I have done this variation of this prompt many, many times in preparation for this, um, for this live stream. And for the most part, the results are similar-ish every time, but there's always gonna be some variability. And in fact, we'll see later on that that is actually a strength, not a weakness, and that you can use that to your advantage. Yeah. So, so let me let me uh, just jump ahead then to um, our big idea, uh, right? The first of our big ideas, and that is that ChatGPT uh, on its own will give us some pretty good guidance on copy that passes the initial sniff test, right? We looked at it, and it's it seemed to make good sense to us when we asked the subsequent question about whether or not, uh, or um, how to, what to consider for marketing e-bikes, which is it's sort of a unique product. Uh, it's a premium product, but there's some very practical uh, sort of features for it. Um, that when we asked it that question, it gave us some, it, it did narrow the focus to specifics about e-bikes in general. And so the, the takeaways that the designer has now is like, here are three points to consider, there more than three because we've, Put a slash with such cheaters, but um, affordability and value as a concept, earth friendliness and sustainability as a concept, and practicality as a concept. Um, and uh, so we can we can we can think about how we want to um, <laughs> crowbar these ideas into that idea that we had about our landing page. Um, but let's get beyond lorem ipsum. We've got this wireframe that we need to that we need to sort of populate with some content to get our ideas out. So let's uh, let's have ChatGPT develop some content for us to use that's better than lorem ipsum. So Jeremy, why don't you take over the share and show us how you would get ChatGPT to deliver that for us? Okay. So again, the prompt here is going to be fairly targeted, right? A paragraph of copy for an e-bike that is targeted at an audience of college students that focuses on the value, earth friendliness, and practicality of the product. We'll go ahead and click. And it gives us a bunch of text. And the first thing I'm noticing is that first sentence seems a little weird to me, Andrew. The green what, ride. It made up a name introducing the green ride e-bike. Hmm. Uh, wait. All right. Well, let's put Where that did it come aside. Up with that? Yeah, let's put that aside. It just made some stuff up. But what about the rest of it? Uh, if we take that up uh, and put that away. So this eco-conscious marvel combines unbeatable value, earth friendliness, and practicality to revolutionize your daily transportation. Say goodbye to cramped buses and costly gas expenses. It's a win-win. It's a win-win. So again, scanning through this, this is way better than Laura Mipsum. That, that is obvious. It's just a lot. 
it's a lot. And there's this pesky little problem about the fact that just made up this text. Sure, I could do like a search and replace, I guess, but maybe there's another way. Well, let's refine this prompt, Jeremy, because I, I feel like limiting the limiting the, the range, we can see you copying and pasting. I know. Um, limiting the amount of content that we wanted to spew back is one thing that we can include in the prompt. Then one, one other thing I wanted to just point out is that like we've already, instead of saying like just write a paragraph about e-bikes, like it would have just generated something rather generic. In this case, we had said for an audience of college students, hmm, okay, and we've specified exactly what points we want the GPT to focus on when it gives us back, right? So it covered it covered a whole lot of good stuff, but it's just too long. Yeah. So we can limit both the language that it uses and the length of the output, and we can even change the tone. Right. So in this case, we're being very specific. We're saying, please write 30 words or less. We are specifying that we want it to do the copy for an e-bike named eCoast. Same audience of college students, same values of, or the same attributes of value, earth friendliness, and practicality, and in a humorous, casual, and personal tone. Now, one thing as it's generating this, I just want to point out that we, we wrote that refined prompt very specifically, and we wrote it out, I would say, in longhand. And we could have just as easily say said something like, do, do that again, but get the name right. It's eCoast and make it sound more casual and personal. And because of the, the way that ChatGPT retains the context of what we're working on, it it would know. We're going to show you a, a technique um, using using that, um, that strategy next. Um, but anyway. This is much better. This looks like hero copy to me. Meet Ecoast, your eco savvy wingman. <laughs> Ditch the gas guzzlers and campus. Does anyone even drive a gas guzzler, really? Yeah, but, they do. They're still out there. Yeah, campus traffic jams, cruise in style while saving cash and the planet. Ecos, the ultimate college ride. Well, that's pretty sweet. That nailed it, right? I'm no copywriter, but it's probably better than I could do given half a day. <laughs> so that's why I stick to, you know, teach. Exactly. So I'm going to let me show, let me go back to sharing my screen. And so that I can just show you again, uh, the, oh, so we, oh, there we go. Um, just so that you can see the prompt that we had just tried uh, in, in more clarity. So, um, we're now going to to go to the next task, which is that what we need to do is um, generate more content for the rest of the, the body the body copy for that for that page. And also, how about a call to action? Um, and so, uh, what we'll do is show you the show you the prompts. But um, as I've mentioned before, we can say. Uh, do that again in 45 words or less and focus on the value of the investment despite the price tag. Do that again and focus on the practicality. Do that again and focus on the sustainability and earth friendliness. And uh, then um, the final prompt for a call to action is to write a call to act, uh, for, to generate the call to action, find a local dealer to take a test ride. So Jeremy, why don't you take us through those prompts and we can see how that looks. Okay, so the first one, do that again in 45 words or less and focus on the value of the investment despite the price tag. So again, this magic little mini prompt of do that again means we don't have to copy paste or type. It will simply understand and have a memory of what it did previously. Ecoast, your eco-friendly college adventure begins. Sure, it's an investment. But picture this, endless savings on gas, no more parking hassles, and guilt-free rides. Worth every penny for a greener tomorrow. Okay, not bad. You're going to have to yeah. break the artifice and go into the, the next one, but... So that that did it. That sounds about right. 
let's try the practicality. So again, this is heading number one, the, the one we previously did. This is heading number two. Media Coast, your smart move for college life. Zip through campus with ease. Avoid traffic snarls and safe on commuting tasks. Practical, eco-friendly, and totally rad. <laughs> that is so... Let's go back into <laughs> So here's the point, and we, we'll talk about this later too, but uh, at any given point, and, and we should mention we are doing this live, and so there's always a little bit of unpredictability, and in fact, at one point, we were like, maybe we shouldn't do this live, and now we're doing it live because it's more fun. But uh, one of the things that you can do at any point is regenerate. So if you don't like any of the results, or if you think it could be do a little better, and there's other reasons to do this. Um, you can simply click the regenerate button, and it will try that prompt again. So it's going to ask you, "Hey, do you think that's better or worse?" Like, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. It doesn't say rad, and so it seems less pandering to me. Yeah. But yep, I would agree. And there's a little carousel, mini carousel here that would allow you to flip and compare the two results. If you added more, you could go ahead and then pick and choose from the ones that you wanted. So it seems to me like the second one is pretty good. Let's do the third. Ben, Andrew, you're going to have to remind me because so, I'm actually going to type. And we'll actually type this time. Ah, oh, yeah, sure. So how about sustainability and earth friendliness? Sustainability and earth friendliness. No, friend. Oh, uh, yeah. Ness. Ecoast, your Earth's BFF. F -F, wow. Embrace guilt free rides with our eco friendly e bike. Cruise campus sustainably, reduce emissions, and make a positive impact. Ride with pride knowing you're saving the planet one pedal at a time. Jeremy, let's go off script for a sec. I'm going to go off script. I was just going to go off script. Why do you want to go off script? Because I was going to say do that again and use some emojis. Yes. Oh, yeah. my God. We, we are like insane. Oh, uh, yeah. We've, we've, tracked, we've, we've used this yeah. uh, too much. Um, so we say an emoji. An emoji? An emoji. Okay. I mean, really, I say go big or go home. And use lots of emoji. How about just emojis? A few. Okay. <laughs> emoji. Let's temper it. Oh. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. I thought a few was three. Yeah. That's four. We have none about that star. Yeah, this is, will give you a sense. I mean, we if we're going off script, then well, we can't really go to You could probably make it do all emojis. Didn't we do that once? Oh, yeah, I think we did. Use all emojis. Which yeah, why not? This is going to make a great first impression. Yeah, uh, this is totally, yeah. Could you imagine? Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. OK, so apparently all emojis was just more than it could handle. It That's right. Probably more sensible than we were, so. <laughs> So I'm going to go back to the presentation slides because I want to I want to jump us through here because um, uh, and in the meanwhile you can generate a prompt yep. for, you can you can do the prompt for the call to action. What I want to do is just show you that like so what we've got is a wireframe now that has some content that may not be awesome and may not be the best, but it's definitely a good starting point. And suddenly this wireframe is starting to take a little bit of shape. Right? Actually, I jumped ahead and I've got the I've got the call to action right here. But I'd be curious to know which call to action did it generate. Was well, it I will show you something interesting uh, because here is this is without getting too close into the dark side. Um, so I did ask it to do the prompt with the call to action. Oh, it, look what it did! It included. It, it remembered that you wanted emojis. Yeah. So this is part of the 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 um, attraction and the danger of this is again this memory that we're using is actually useful, but um, sometimes it also gets in the way. So, but basically, if you would remove the emojis, and we could probably tell it to do that, but we don't need to do that right now. It just says, find your nearest de uh, dealer now and take a thrilling test ride. Yeah. So, I mean, again, we're not asking it to, to, to develop marketing copy for some esoteric, hard to imagine product. It's a bicycle. We're selling it to college students. It, it's not all that difficult to do. 
Um, but we've got a good mock-up and we use ChatGPT to do it. What I'm going to do is just remind you a little bit about what our prompts were. So the first thing is that we asked about the marketing com considerations for the college audience, both in general and specifically for an e-bike, this e-bike. Um, we had to generate some hero copy, three paragraphs of body copy and a call to action. Uh, and we also did a few other things. We'll do. We'll we'll share with you the specifics of our strategies of of what we did. But I'll, just as a reminder, we use the lim limiting the output. Right? We said do it in thirty words or less. Use this language, not that language. Um, use this tone, etc. So now we're going to jump ahead to um, our second audience, um, and <laughs> we're not going to take you through the whole thing one step at a time, right? But similar prompts, different audience, and this audience. This audience is, um, we're referring to them as retirees, but they don't necessarily need to be retired in order to fall into this category. You know how segmentation works. Um, but the question is, can we refine and develop a new prompting strategy based on what we learned from the first round? And again, this is a bit of a leap, leap but follow along. It'll make sense, I promise. And of course, the answer is yes, we can. Yeah. yeah. So this is this is kind of like a, a really interesting big idea, and that is that the more context that you bring to the prompt, the better the results tend to be. I insisted on putting the asterisk there because what does better mean? And we know that this is a language model. It's not a knowledge model. Inaccuracy is just part of the game. It's putting words together that seem to fit patterns that it has ingested and made connections with. So what does better really mean? In this case, better really means that it's more, uh, more, more specific to what it is that we're expecting the outcome to be. Right? We had an idea in our mind that we wanted the language to have a particular tone and that we wanted it to fit a certain shape in our design. Not, uh, it needed to take up a certain amount of real estate. And so we gave it the context and it delivered the result more appropriately. That's what better means. It doesn't mean more accurate because accuracy is really about factual accuracy. If you want to say it's a more accurate result, it's more accurate to what it is that you wanted it to be. And that's an important sort of uh, difference. Anyway, back to our prompts. And we should really call this a super prompt. Because mega, mega, mega super prompt, prompt. turbo it's prompt. It's a lot of copy and we're going to break it down into these three big chunks and then we'll go and we'll run it. But it is worth kind of just taking a step back and just dissecting this a little bit because yes, there's a lot here, but in fact, much of it we've already done, but we're putting it together in a new way and to the point here, given more context. So um, the first paragraph here, let's go ahead and Hit them. Yeah. So the, the first prompt is you're an award winning advertising copywriter, and you're going to help me to create copy for two marketing landing pages for an e bike called the e coast. And we're going to target an audience of retirees for these landing pages. And so far, you can see that it's not so different from what the from how we shaped the prompt the first time around for the college students. The difference is, we're saying that we want the AI to play a particular role, an award-winning advertising copywriter. Um, we're also expecting the output to be copy for two marketing landing pages. And we're specifying a marketing landing page as a thing. So uh, we're sort of relying on ChatGPT to know what a landing page is. And we're specifying this audience of retirees. And that's our in intended audience. Um, now, this is the second part of the prompt. We're using that moniker, retirees, to describe a demographic group of 60 to 85 years old, years old or year old men and women who are financially able to retire and enjoy their leisure. We're already imbuing this with a fair amount of value here. While we're referring to this audience as retirees, we shouldn't use the words retire, retirement, or retiree. Okay, this is our way of limiting the language um, that it's going to generate for us. And the third part, uh, I think there are three parts. Um, we know that this audience can be price conscious. 
They're concerned with safety, stability, and quality of e-bikes. They're very interested in the practicality and range of their e-bikes. Their wellness and independence are also very important. The copy needs to be friendly, trustworthy, and encouraging. And so price conscious, safety, stability, quality, practicality, range, wellness, and independence. These are those concepts that we would have drawn from asking ChatGPT the same question up front, which is what are the considerations when marketing an e-bike to an audience of retirees? And in this case, we're also specifying what the tone or style should be. Again, I'm hoping that you can see that there's, there's some themes in the way that we think about these prompts, which is what role should AI take? What tone should it take? What in the intended audience is? And uh, what sort of size of content? What's the shape of the content that we want? Yep. Okay, so we'll come back to this slide in a second. But what I'm going to do here is um, something just slightly different. So again, at any given point, we have this super prompt. But as you've already seen, this memory, we've actually seen unintentionally what happens uh, as it's inherited all of these emojis. So a best practice here too is to just start a new chat. In other words, just, just start from, from scratch and make sure that um, you're just giving it the raw material up front, which again, there's a lot of copy here, but we broke it down into these three big paragraphs and then big money, big money. Boop, 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 boop. Oh yeah, it knows what a landing page is. Well, it knows what a hero section is. It even told us what kind of image to consider using. It gave us a CTA section. It's magic. It's the best thing ever. If only it didn't lie so much. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we're skipping over some of that. Well, also we're in the business of lying right now. We're, we're having a conjure up content. And we and that's it's doing that job really well for us. It's making it up. It really yeah. is. And so this is pretty impressive. And again, one of the major points, and we can again not obviously going to read through all this, but just looking at some of those details that we we're semi joking about, it's kind of remarkable. So it gave us a hero section, um, picture of a happy couple exploring scenic landscapes on their e coast e bikes with big smiles and a sense of adventure. Sounds about right. That, um, if that's what retirement is, I want to retire, Jeremy. <laughs> uh, even down here in the CTA section, so call to action for those who aren't familiar with the language. So join the so headline, join the eCoast community today. Subheadline, rediscover the joy of exploration and independence. Call to action button, explore eCoast e-bikes. Footer section. So there are versions of language learning models and um, some of the more sophisticated ones. You could translate this to things like markdown code, which is actually something we've done in the past and we can show at some point in the future. In theory, if you told it the syntax that you might want, um, so like maybe instead of um, parentheses for the buttons, you do prefer curly braces or something, you could instructed to do that. But the main point is it gave us a lot. And clearly, we're not going to run through this and read all of it out loud to you. Um, but uh, this is something you would want to do, trust me, uh, because we've stayed away from a lot of factual information, as Andrew has hinted. Um, but this reinforces the fact that this is very good at generating marketing style copy. Um, yeah. So let me let's let's uh, let's move on, Jeremy. I, um, because what I want to do. So um, again, back to this slide. It, as a best practice, consider the context of the chat that you're having, and consider moving uh, starting a new chat if you want to start a brand new context. Um, if you're not getting the results that you look that you, or if you find that you're going down a path and you're not happy with the path that you're going, you can always just start a new chat. Um, as a just an interesting point, when Bing first launched, it could only um, have six 
points in this chat before it asked you to start a new one. So there was a limit to how much memory it could retain. Um, it was updated then to 30, per, 30 steps per chat. Um, so it doesn't seem that there's any limit to how much memory ChatGPT will hold on to. Um, I guess the the other thing is that uh, in, <laughs> it's a in our case we had a pretty modest goal, which was generate content that looks like the right thing, but doesn't necessarily have to be the right thing because we aren't the copywriters. We're designers, and we're supposed to be pitching ideas, concepts for landing pages, and we just wanted something that was better than Laura Mipsum. If we were actually going to use this copy, um, you know, seriously, <laughs> like for the actual page, I think we'd want to pay very close attention to the specific language. Yeah. I think it's my close. Other, yeah, sorry. My my other point here again, this was this is a hard point to kind of clarify, but in a way it goes back to what I mentioned earlier about what we now think of as like traditional programming, where we're kind of used to staying on the rails and just following the path that the software takes us. And one of the things about embracing the randomness is just realizing like, okay, yeah, if I just sit there and regenerate some results like three or four times there might be little nuggets of gold in there that i could use but it's this idea that it go i i tried to uh, phrase it in the terms of like a multiverse which andrew you told me was bleak or something but <laughs> the idea that like whenever you regenerate you're taking your content in a slightly different form and it's going down a different path and if you don't open up a little bit and, and allow yourself to go down this path, you might actually be walling off some good um, information. So. Yeah, so when we were doing the, when we were running through this uh, numerous times, every time, as Jeremy mentioned, it kept on generating new stuff. And every time we would re regenerate, it gave us new ideas and new ideas to pursue subsequently. And so um, the, I guess the best thing, the best recommendation I can make is, that you should explore these tools and you should play with them and you should you should pay close attention to what they do and at very least use them as ideation tools if not for generating actual placeholder copy or if you're crazy using it for production but don't use it for production anyway here's the point we've just generated in a short amount of time <laughs> we've spent a lot of time talking through it um, we've generated two wireframes for two different audiences that pitch an idea. Now, obviously, we we didn't use that really excellent turbo prompt to generate the content on the second one. But the point is that we've got these two wireframes. What I want to do is just go through the, the review of our prompts and some of the strategies that we used. And then we're going to get to the really cool stuff um, because we're running sh short on time. So. Um, all right, we specified the voice, and this is something you can do when you try this at home. Um, and you can you can uh, uh, you you can also specify the level of thinking, right? So you could also say like, explain it to me like I'm five, or make a list, or whatever. But um, we also limited with the length of content. We limited in the sense that we excluded specific terms so that we could shape it the way that we wanted. We showed you that we can regenerate answers when we don't like the use of the word rad. We took advantage of that check GPT memory or context by saying, do it again, do it again. Like we don't have to keep on asking you as if we're asking you for the very first time. Um, and um, then also breaking that by forcing a new chat to start from the beginning. Uh, and then learning from the process to come up with what's a super prompt. If you can put all the context up front in that initial prompt, you can get a much better result. Certainly you can start from the beginning with, give me these words, give me these words in this, but limit it to 30, give me these words and then add a tone to it. Give me these words and add emojis to it. You could put that all up in the first, in the beginning of your prompt, in the first prompt that you start with and you're beginning with a much better result. Now we're going to show you the really cool stuff. Jeremy, I'm going to hand this over to you. This is yeah. your expertise. And, um, yeah. and basically, we're going to be giving prompts to a system yeah. that's instead of giving us words, it's going to give us images. Yeah. And for those in the audience, too, um, again, we had to restart this live stream. Um, so the chat GPT section is kind of over. Um, however, this is 
and what we're going to talk about here is mid-journey, um, which is image generation, uses a very similar concept. Uh, not, and we're not going to go into as much detail. It's also not going to be live. So I'm going to kind of run through this. Um, so mid-journey is, so again, here, here is our beginning um, state. This is all of the information that we pulled from chat GPT and put into a mock-up. Much, much better than the original, but still really lacking any visual panache or anything. And so that's what we're also going to do. So mid-journey, again, just keeping it short, um, it's similar to chat GPT. It, it's a language learning model on its own but it creates images. And there are alternatives out there. I like Midjourney. I feel like it creates one of the more sophisticated results out there. Um, all of these work on a very similar process. They, it's not necessarily intuitive. There's not like a huge database of images that it like mashes together. It actually starts with this complex noise that you see on the left. So that's actually how images get generated. It starts with noise and then it removes the noise. So think of it like a block of granite and you're chiseling away at it and an image or a sculpture of a person emerges. It's kind of like that. It's like the digital version of a sculpture. It's removing noise and giving you what you want at the end. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff you can do. Again, diffusion models, um, Oops, that's wrong. Anyway, that's right, but it's the wrong heading. Uh, so there's a lot of sophistication. They're, they're extremely sophisticated, and the technology has changed dramatically over the last year, which is how, about as how long uh, as I've been using it. So again, we've got some tasks. We want eight images, one hero image, plus three images for our college students. And then we want another series, one hero, plus three images for our retiree audience. So again, we're not going to go, I'm not going to go into mid journey. I'm just going to show you the prompts here. So a photograph of a 19 year old smiling female college student riding a white e-bike through a college campus during spring. Now, the only thing that might throw you off here is this syntax at the end, dash dash AR 16 colon nine. So AR stands for aspect ratio. And 16 by 9 is kind of like that widescreen ratio that you might be familiar to with like an HD TV or something like that. And why did I specify that? Well, because we know that the mock-up uses a 16 by 9 aspect ratio. So we're actually taking a really fast shortcut. We don't have to crop this photo in theory in Photoshop or anything. So here's our first result. We get four smiling college students on bikes kind of riding down the road and at first glance like these look pretty darn good uh, the way that mid-journey and many of these image generators work is they give you the ability to iterate on any specific image and you could also upscale or create a high resolution from one of or one more all four actually but we're going to choose number three and say we want to upscale that and yeah, it looks good, except there's a small problem because uh, I would be ready to use this. I'd be like, okay, this is cool, but that bike is not the e-bike. It's not the one. It's not, it's our, not even close. It's not even close. It looks like a Schwinn, like you would ride in like grade school or something. So yeah, you know, this is just a mock-up, but is that really giving a good impression as a designer? <laughs> to put like the product of the bike company that you're working for and not even have it look close to the bike? And the answer is, I don't know. Well, Jeremy, consider this, right? The alternative yeah. would be to search for something on the like Adobe stock photos or whatever, and then you're just going to get a lot of pictures of, it seems women who are laughing at salads, right? <laughs> but I mean, if you could get a picture of someone on a bicycle, this is what you would get and you wouldn't really have a choice. Correct. So here is our little cheat. Here's a little tip for you. Uh, there is a way, and this is mid-journey specific as far as I know. Some of the other, well, some of the other systems will do it, but not in the same way. So using some of your uh, web design skills or hacks, there are very simple ways to go into almost any web page and to copy the URL of a specific image. So you right-click on it, you choose open new image in, or open image in new tab, 
or you could even save the image or copy it or copy the image address. And there's a lot of options. Essentially, what you're doing is taking a URL, which is indicated at the very beginning here by this kind of nonsensical HTTPS. What is that? That is just the picture of the bike. That's all it is. And then you're creating a hybrid prompt where the first part is pointing to the URL of the image. The second one is exactly the same, although I did add some other things based on maybe giving a little bit more direction. We want a full shot. It would be nice to see the whole bike. Those white trees didn't really, I don't know, they didn't do it for me. I want green trees. And I'm a designer. I want some complementary colors, maybe, just, just to see what happens. So here is the result, and please forgive the black border around it. But the first thing I will say is it kind of nailed the bike part. Like that is the bike, more or less, kind mm -hmm. of. Like it's close-ish. It's closer than it was before, for sure. Um, this being AI and this being an image generator, it's going to add details that are beyond your control. You can take some time and fine tune this if that's your thing. Again, for our purposes, we don't need Prototype, to do Jeremy. It's disposable. It's disposable. disposable. We don't, don't, don't want to go down that path. We don't want to go down that path. It's tempting. The other part of it, if you look a little closely, even though uh, image generation has gotten much better over the last year, uh, things like hands, for example, were a real problem, but also some other details. You start looking closely at some of these images and it's like, wait, <laughs> she's not actually on the bike? You don't kind of have to look all that closely. <laughs> we, yeah. When we saw this, we were wondering, is this a technique, maybe yeah. a side saddle? Yeah. So. We're going to regenerate again. This is similar to what we did in ChatGPT. Anytime you're not happy with something, you just have it do it again. It's really like rolling the dice. You might get better results, you might not. The truth is, all we really need is kind of one promising one, and we're just going to we're going to use this. We're going to say, for the most part, <laughs> she's on the bike. The bike looks right. Green trees. Close enough. It's a prototype. Ship it. Okay, now we're going to run through these. I did a couple other prompts. So we want one of someone commuting. So a smiling male multicultural college student riding a white e-bike through heavy city traffic, cars driving on the road, evocative expression, detailed facial features. This is my personal gift, my personal hack or tip to any mid-journey users. For whatever reason, when you specify things like evocative expression, detailed facial features, it does a better job of creating more detail and realistic photos. Just a little tip for you. Having said that, this looks pretty good. This is for practicality. We really wanted a picture of someone waving. So we basically gave that exact same prompt. And you can see how fast these go. Once you get the basic um, template down, it's just a matter of swapping out some of the things that you would like. In this case, someone waving their hand. Is she waving? Well, no, it's the peace sign, but you know what? I kind of like that better. Yeah. <laughs> so let's run with it. And for the last one, we just had fun. A photograph of a 22-year-old smiling male college student wearing a hippie poncho, <laughs> walking his white e-bike on a college campus quad while waving to a group of college students playing hacky sack. And <laughs> cars in the background. <laughs> we just like this guy. <laughs> Roman, our uh, director of talent technology, pointed out his legs are not really accurate. But you know what? His smile is great. Yeah, it's a good thing that he's he's writing the step through frame. <laughs> the point is, these are just prototypes. So you know what? We're going to run with it. This is what the final prototype would look like. Way better than our lorem ipsum um situation and way and better. to be clear it's not a very it's not a very innovative design right i mean this got us to this point where it's like hey cool like i just painted the wireframe but this is where you get to now start to have fun you've got real assets you've got real copy you could you could tweak it if you wanted to but it's starting to look like it could be a landing page yep. and now you can start to explore new design options. Yeah. 
And I think we just end it here. Um, does that make sense? And then we can take some Q&A. Because the point yeah. is, I think that that this is the point. Again, we took some time getting there. But in the end, this would probably take a real world time of, I don't know, I think we decided maybe 15, 20 minutes, depending on your skill level. And the ultimate point that we wanted to make was that this gets the designer to the fun part faster. You learn something about the product. You learn it quickly. It's better than doing it on a search and having to navigate all those results. And the ultimate thing is you're, you're letting chat GPT and mid journey kind of do some of the, what I would call the, the, the gut work to begin with things that you're going to have to throw out anyway. And now you can have fun. Now you can experiment with colors and typography and layout, and you can have all of that fun, but you've got like a good core and you got it quickly. So there you go. All right. So do we have any questions? Those of you who are watching in the mm -hmm. Anyone? How do we get questions? Do we know? Did we figure it out that part? <laughs> I'm looking in Slack and hoping that we'll get some. So, ah, all right. No? Any questions? No. No questions. OK. Cool. Well, we should then at least uh, talk about the next version of this that we'd, that we'd like to do. And maybe this will trigger some some thoughts. So again, yeah. Andrew and I presented <clears throat> this in an, in an ideal scenario. <clears throat> we went through a lot of dead ends and some, and we found some places that ChatGPT is not very good at. There's a lot of issues that get, get brought up, rightfully so, about things like the um, quality of the data uh, there are some biases that are built into a lot of these systems. We encountered some of this stuff, but what we really encountered and what we will you know, talk about in the future is, is, again, how much you can rely on the factual accuracy of chat GPT. It's getting better. We were, we've been working with chat, three, uh, chat GPT 3.5 and chat GPT-4 is out and they're getting more sophisticated and they're learning all the time. But having said that, there are still some real flaws and some things that you need to be careful. You've probably read some of the articles about like the lawyer who cited a case that was generated in chat GPT in court and got called out big time because that case didn't exist. And well, and in fairness, he did uh, say do you, is there a reference, like, did this case really happen? And ChatGPT said, of course it did. So sure. I will point that out, too. It will lie straight to your face. Anthologically. Sometimes it will admit to it, and sometimes it will just apologize. Like, oops, I'm sorry. Yeah. All right. Well, cool. I guess if there are no questions, then we will uh, we'll wrap it up. Yeah. Join us next time for more. AI-induced follies. <laughs> <laughs>